Okay, Beyond Good and Evil, section one. Um, I'm gonna try and meander a little less. Um, it's, I just spent some time rewatching the previous video. And I digressed quite a bit. So, um, what I'm gonna do, hopefully very quickly, is go through on the prejudices of the philosophers. There are a few very important insights that we have to linger a little bit on. And um, I will try to highlight those as we go, but as you can see from um, the board behind me, the main sections that I will be talking about are kind of listed here, right? This can even happen as almost a list, because that's more or less what Nietzsche, through argument, is building section by section. Here are a list of all of the dogmas of the dogmatists, right? So uh, that's what he's doing here, but along the way, through his criticisms of these dogmas, we start building his position, right? So, uh, like, for example, in the first section, it starts off, the will to truth, which will seduce us uh, yet to many a risky venture. Uh, that famous truthfulness about which uh, all philosophers to date have spoken with deference. What manner of questions has this will to truth presented us? What strange, wicked, questionable questions? It's, it, it, it is already a long story, and yet it doesn't, doesn't it seem uh, uh, just, uh, to be just getting started? Is it a wonder that we finally grow suspicious? Lose patience, turn around impatiently, that we learn from this Sphinx how to pose questions of our own. Who is actually asking the questions here? What is it in us that really wants to get at the truth? Now, this idea of the will to truth is something that stands behind the history of Western philosophy pretty fundamentally. Right? So I've got a colleague out of Oakland who describes his research as he's, he's really into truth. Right? And generally, when he describes the truth, picture this and a board a million times larger than this as the whole of the truth and this single point right there as what we know of it. Uh -huh. Now, he's really into this. Philosophers generally are really into this notion of the truth. Right? And this is effectively what Socrates knew nothing of. I know nothing of the truth. That basically, philosophers have spent millennia trying to lay out the basic underlying structure of the truth. And Nietzsche, <laughs> 2,400 years later, is, is actually pausing finally to ask the question, what's the value of this will to truth. Why don't we pr prefer untruth? Eh? Why is it presupposed as the starting point for rational thought? Why is it presupposed as the starting point for in an interrogation of human value that, you know, we should prefer truth to untruth? Right? Now, it, now, I'm not going to linger on this idea for too terribly long. I did some of that in the previous video, right? But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really a presupposition at the heart, right, of Western philosophy, right? He continues here. Uh, the problem, a little bit further down, I'm skipping a paragraph. The problem of the value of the truth appeared before us, or did we appear before it, which appears Oedipus, which of us is the Sphinx? It's a rendezvous, so it seems, of questions and question marks. And uh, would you believe in the end, it seems to us as if the problem had never yet been posed, as we were seeing it for the first time, focusing on it, daring it? For there is daring to it, and perhaps no daring greater. Right? This is an initial thrust, this one section, this one section that makes strange this notion of the will to truth. This is his original sort of, 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 of first sort of volley right, at this question. We'll see it recur 
a few times in different ways um, throughout this section. But uh, largely what he's posing here is the idea that, you know, we have this belief in the will to truth that guides us. Right? There are a couple of textures to the kind of questions that he's going to be asking here. The, the, the first of which is, you know, why do we value it? Right? It seems to be something with intrinsic value and the starting point for all sorts of inquiry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if we are really going to deeply interrogate the value of values, right, then the starting point has to be this fundamental sort of cornerstone value. Right? Why is it value valuable? Right? This is a presupposition at the heart of philosophy. Right? And really, he's pointing out that this, this moment, 2400 years into this inquiry into trying to lay, out, lay bare the structure of truth, right? this is the first time somebody has paused to ask, why, 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 why do we prefer truth to untruth? Uh, oh, why, why not? And this is what I was getting at um, in in the introductory lecture. Right? Well, at the end of all this, it might be preferable to actually formulate beliefs that are necessary rather than true, valuable rather than true, helpful rather than true. Right. And like I say, he'll go further into this notion. Right. Um, this will to truth has been presupposed as sort of the driving force. Philosophy begins in wonder. We wonder about the truth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and that's where. But really, is this is there this independent sort of organ within the mind of a researcher that just kind of spins out like clockwork, trying to discover the truth? Is it possible to isolate something like that? Right, in the researcher, right? Even even in the, the, the straight sort of data-driven scientific kind of researcher, is it a will to truth or is it some sort of instinct or desire playing itself out, right? Desire for mastery, desire for control, desire for power, desire to shape the world in terms of a system that we build, right? Now, the, and on the prejudices of the philosophers, Nietzsche is going to give us lots of examples of philosophical schools that have attempted to shape the world to it, their will, right? right? To live according, it's later on in the section on the Stoics, right? His criticism of them is, um, this is in section nine, you want to live according to nature, O oh, you noble Sto Stoics, what deceit lies in your words? Imagine a creature constituted like nature, pro uh, prodigal beyond measure, um, neutral beyond measure, with no purpose or conscience, with no consumption or fairness, fertile, desolate, uncertain, etc., etc. Now, effectively what Nietzsche is pointing out about these Stoics is that it's not that they want to live according to nature, they want to order nature according to their will, right? They impose an interpretation, an idea of nature, and try to change nature to be as they will it to be, right? So effectively what Nietzsche is going to lay bare here, right, through various arguments is the idea that, you know, when we will to understand the truth, or to represent the truth, or to interpret the truth effectively, that will speaks of an instinct or desire that's within us. It's not and not some sort of purely rational, dispassionate mechanism like clockwork that spins out in the mind of the researcher. Right? There is instinct, desire, and will. A simple way to understand this, what's the first thing we need to do if we're going to come to know anything? Simple answer, give a damn. We've got to dispose ourselves in a way that cares. And, you know, it, it speaks to a need, right? So this will to truth, right? Nietzsche's questioning as the cornerstone of philosophy here, really isn't 
a will to truth at all. It is an extension of our desires or our instincts. But one more thing I'm going to point out about this, and we're in section one, and I was supposed to be quick about this, right? Um, the problem of truth, and I already quoted this, but nonetheless, the problem of the value of truth appeared before us, or did we appear before it, which of us is Oedipus, which is this famous, it's a rendezvous, so it seems, um, of questions and question marks. When we philosophize by systems, systems have an order of their own. They have an order of their own. They are systems laid out with presuppositions that have intentions that it seem to have almost a will of their own. When I follow a line of thought, a thought is a line of thought in so far as it progresses through fairly predictable kind of ways. If I'm thinking about a problem in one way, only certain issues will appear before me. But really, which of us is appearing before the other? Right? Is it the system that led me to the kinds of questions and issues that in a sense created those questions and issues? Now, I'm thinking back to something in one of the videos from Roderick. Um, it, it very early on, I think it might even be the Socrates video, where um, he's critiquing analytic philosophy and he's doing so a little too hard, I think. But nonetheless, right, um, he, he points out that analytic philosophy, right, by his argument, it, it hasn't really solved a single dang philosophical problem except the ones that it's created for itself. It's kind of like, the metaphor that he's using is it's kind of like you spill the stuff and you clean it up, and you spill the stuff again and you clean it up, and that sort of thing. Nietzsche is presenting a notion somewhat like that, wherein the systems of thought that we subscribe to create issues and problems for us. We don't solve problems and issues by utilizing these systems, these systems present us with issues and problems, and we kind of spin away trying to... So, in, 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 in who is the agent here becomes the question. Are we governed in our inquiries by these systems that bring us to the issues and problems and questions and question marks, as, um, as Nietzsche points out, or are we going to assert some form of agency over our own research, right? And the only way that I can think of, and the way that Nietzsche suggests throughout this section that we might actually assert some form of agency here is by looking straight in the face of these kinds of dangerous questions and question marks, the ones that call question to the underlying presuppositions and prejudices of the systems that we ascribe to, and the ones that we don't even realize are there. So that's one heck of an introduction to um, uh, this section one on the prejudices of the philosophers. Um, a few um, other sort of prejudices. The idea that we have uh, a faith in value oppositions, right? A belief in value oppositions, right? Um, he takes on the voice of, um, you know, the classical philosopher at the beginning of this section. How could something arrive, uh, arise from its opposite? truth from error, for example, or the will to truth uh, from the will to deception, or altruism from egoism, or the wise man's pure, radiant contemplation from covetous desire. Such origination is impossible, say the, 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 the dogmatists. Whoever dreams of it is a fool, or worse, those things of highest value must have different origin, their own. They cannot be derived from this perishable, seductive, deceptive, lowly world, from this confusion of desire and delusion. Rather, their basis must lie in the womb of existence, in the imperishable, in the hidden God, in the thing in itself, reference to Kant, um, and nowhere else. 
that first paragraph, that first chunk, you should note, right, is Nietzsche picking up the voice of these prejudicial sort of dogmatist philosophers. Right? This is a classical argument that we can trace from Plato to Aristotle through the medieval period all the way up to um, Enlightenment philosophy and Kant to a certain extent in Hume as well. That's at the root of Western philosophy. There are these things that oppose one another, right? You know, it being nothingness, right? Good, evil, perfection, imperfection, immortal, mortal, immutable, immutable, right? So there are really these things that are diametrically opposed to one another. Question is, where is the evidence? Or as Nietzsche puts it, judgments of this kind constitute the typical prejudice by which we can always recognize a metaphysician of every age. This kind of value judgment is at the back of all the logical proceedings. From this, uh, from out of this belief of theirs, they go about seeking their knowledge, uh, which they end by ceremon uh, ceremoniously dubbing the truth. The metaphysicians fundamental belief is the belief in opposition of philosophers, or in, in opposition of values. I'm sorry about that. All right. So effectively, right, this is at the heart of metaphysics again. Right? First, they believe in a will to truth, then they believe in these oppositions of values. Right? But where do we find actual evidence of this? And a philosopher who Nietzsche actually speaks kind of kindly of, a uh, pre-Socratic philosopher we've come across in the context of this course, is Heraclitus, who basically in terms of the, the, the use of logos that he suggests, he suggests that really what we should look for is not oppositions, but rather an attempt through the use of logos, reason and language, to sort of tear down that supposed opposition, to see the unity in opposites, to see the mutual dependency in opposites. And this is, this is where Nietzsche picks it up here, right? It could even be possible that the value of those good and honored things consists in precisely the fact that in an insidious way, they are related to those bad, seemingly opposite things, linked, knit together, even identical, perhaps, perhaps. But who is willing to worry about such dangerous perhapses? We must wait for, get this, a new category of philosophers to arrive, those whose taste and inclination are the reverse of their predecessors. They will be, in every sense, philosophers of dangerous perhapses. And to speak in all seriousness, I see these new philosophers coming. Right. So effectively, what Nietzsche is doing, and this is something I did not point out to you, but I should now. Um, where is it? The, the subtitle of this book, Beyond Good and Evil, is a prelude to the philosophy of the future. And now that we have come to the point where, one, we can recognize these prejudices as prejudices, and two, right, are in a position to think through them, think past them, thanks to the historicism that I was intro in, in, introducing in the previous video, right? it's now possible, and Nietzsche would argue in sort of a human sense, necessary, Right, that a new category of philosophers rise to meet the challenges of the overcoming of these value oppositions. Right. So that's where we're going. Right. Now, <clears throat> related to what we were saying with regard to um, the will to truth, right, 
in section th three, he introduces right, uh, the idea that, and I'm quoting here from your page seven at section three, if you don't have this version of the book that we should, I asked you to buy, um, the, the largest part of conscious thinking has to be considered uh, instinctual activity, even in the case of philo philosophical thinking. We need a new understanding here, just as we've come to a new understanding of heredity and the innate. Just as the act of birth is scarcely relevant to the entire process and progress of heredity, so consciousness is scarcely opposite to the instincts in any decisive sense. Most philosophers' conscious thinking is secretly guided and channeled into particular tracks by its instincts, behind all logic, too. And its apparent tyranny of movement there are value judgments, or to speak more clearly, uh, physiological demands for the preservation of a particular kind of life. That a certainty is worth more than an uncertainty, for example, or appearance is worth less than, quote, truth. Whatever their regulatory importance for us, such evaluations might still be nothing but foreground evaluations. A certain kind of naivete, right, um, as is required for the preservation of beings like us, given that, they're given, that is, that man is not necessarily the measure of all things. Now, what Nietzsche is arguing here, right, is that, you know, you think back to your Socrates, right, in Socrates, key to understanding his position is that we should be persuaded by reasons and not by opinions or beliefs. You see the harsh sort of distinction there? Trace that over to Kant. And effectively, what we are trying to do when we employ the formulations of the categorical imperative is put our instincts, our drives, incentives, or anything particular to us that might act as a desire Right. Aside, put it in bracket, brackets, kick it to the corner, and take up this perspective in terms of the first formulation of the categorical imperative of the universal. Right. We ask ourselves, right, if the principle behind our action, not not the actual action, not the desire that brought about the thought about the action or something along those lines, if in principle lacking all inclinations and desires, right? that principle could stand as a universal law. Right? Remember that critique by the self-love moralists that said, no, 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 right? It, you can't do that. That doesn't work. That just, it can't, we don't have the capacity. Nietzsche is making, in some ways, a more advanced sort of issuance of that same critique here. Right? Even when we are attempting to use some sort of dispassionate, unencumbered reason that is sort of spinning its way out in some sort of clockwork kind of fashion. Right? Not only are the systems that we employ, including the Kantian moral system, built with desires and inclinations and will in value presuppositions right into it, but the person applying that system also has their inclinations, desires, preferences, and values implanted in it. So, it shows philosophy to be not this dispassionate kind of reasoned activity, but rather desires, instinctual. Uh, which kind of cuts to the core of it, not only philosophical theorizing, but it, more specifically moral theorizing, right? The, even when we're applying um, the, the principle of utility, right? We're asking ourselves what the greatest good for the greatest number is, that comes pregnant with value presuppositions as well, right? pleasure and pain and interpretations of our own experiences then applied to other people's preferences, right? et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? There are 
presuppositions about the value of values built right into that system, and when you apply the principle of utility and I apply the principle of utility, we may just come to a different conclusion because we have different instincts, drives, and desires. So, if the whole edifice of dispassionate sort of, 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 of engagement right, with, 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 with a supposed truth turns out to be a fiction, right, where do we go from there? Right? So you, you see what Nietzsche is doing here. He's problematizing in this section. He's problematizing. Right? What he's going to do later on and throughout the, the, the remainder of Beyond Good and Evil is try to address these problems that he's raised. Right. Now, there's an important note he makes in the next section, in section four, or yeah, section four, right? It, this teaches us something about the kind of critique that Nietzsche is is trying to build. And this is this is fascinating, I think, and I think why Nietzsche is an important crit critic and theorist right, for precisely uh, the political and cultural moment that we find ourselves in. See what he's done? He's broken down the will to truth. He's broken down the notion of value oppositions. He's pointed out that conscious thought really finds its root in instinctual activity. Think of the status of politics any, anywhere in the world that I'm looking at these days. I mean, in Canadian politics and American politics and Spanish politics, etc., etc. Right? You know, we're existing where powerful rhetoric or the repetition of obvious falsehoods seems to be preferred. To any sort of disposition that would require truth, honesty, or a fair accounting of the facts. We exist in a cultural and political situation where belief oppositions, value oppositions, right? It's the liberal, progressive, conservative in Canada, right? Republican, Democrat, right? In the United States, let's. Let's let's go to Britain and talk about you know the the, the, the Brexit movement versus the, the 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 movement of people that wanted to stay part of the EU, right? Let's look at the party sort of the the, 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 the sort of isolationist strong nationalist movement in Germany, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are opposed kind of positions, right? That people ascribe to and believe, right? What happens if we start breaking down those oppositions, if we move beyond those kind of oppositions? We might find ourselves in some productive crowd. Elections in both Canada and the United States, as well as in Britain and in Germany, for example, um, have shown us that, you know, it's not uh, the rational argument, the, the weight of the better argument that carries the day, no matter who's winning these elections, right? It's largely, it's appealed to the instincts, right? That winds up being the persuasive kind of, you know, action-orienting kind of principle, right? Now, what Nietzsche tells us next is something interesting. We don't object to a judgment just because it's false. This is probably what is strangest about our new language. The question is rather to what extent the judgment furthers life, preserves life, preserves the species, and perhaps even cultivates the species, and we are in principle inclined to claim, get this, that judgments that are the most false are the most indispensable to us, that man could not live without accepting logical functions, without measuring reality by the purely invented world of the unconditional self-referential, without continual falsification of the world by means of number, that to give up false judgments would be to give up life, deny life, admitting untruth as a condition of life, 
That means to resist familiar values in a dangerous way. And a philosophy that dares this has already placed itself beyond good and evil. I don't know how, but Nietzsche seems to have sort of anticipated the post-truth cultural moment we find ourselves in. And the strange thing is uh, that just in that one small little passage that I just read to you, what Nietzsche has supplied us with is an interesting basis for critique that's even potent in a post-truth environment. Maybe we stop saying, but what you're saying isn't true. I think we need to, it's not working. Right? It's not working, all of these fact-checking kind of things, they don't work, right? Because guess what? To a certain extent, our culture has come around to this position where we just might not care about the truth anymore. But along with this idea of true facts and true interpretations, because how can an interpretation ever be true? It's an interpretation, it's a representation of something else using means other than that thing itself, right? When we represent something, it's, it's, it's always an interpretation, and insofar as it's an interpretation, it's a perspective, right? So if we're getting beyond truth, how do we evaluate our beliefs? The one who just told us, right? We should ask ourselves, if the judgment or the belief furthers life, preserves life, preserves the species, perhaps even cultivates the species. Right? Is the belief that is being espoused healthy? Right? It's not a healthy belief. Even, even if we admit that, you know, to a certain extent, we just don't give a damn about the truth anymore. Right? we can still hold our beliefs to a standard. Right? It's no longer perhaps the justified true belief model as espoused by Socrates and so on. Right? But perhaps it's the belief that happens to be productive, happens to be helpful, preserves the species, cultivates the species, stimulates it, it, new understandings, new ideas, new trajectories, new capacities in the human being, and that sort of thing, right? Perhaps, perhaps, even if we can no longer make reference to an emphatic notion of truth in terms of cultural dialogue, we can still demand that the beliefs and judgments that are espoused be healthy, right? What you're saying isn't true. That's not a persuasive position any more, right? argues Nietzsche. So, what do we have next? Now, in section five, you know what, I'm skipping it. I'm skipping it. And I thought there was something there, but I don't think it's necessary. I'm going to section six. And so effectively what I'm doing is, oh, whoops, wrong O, that. And I just erased the thing, right, that I wanted. So I'll pause and I'll get that back on. Okay, disaster averted. And so I've just taken section four off what I'm discussing here. Um, it's an interesting argument, but um, has to do with how we get our ideas and blah blah. Right? I think the most important early section of of section one here has to do with this claim in number five, which is. Uh, Glad it's back on the board there. I'm going to quote it, and then we're going to unpack it. Uh, 
Little by little, I came to understand what every great philosophy to date has been. The personal confession of its author, a kind of unintended and unwitting uh, memoir. And similarly, that all uh, that the moral or immoral aims in every philosophy constituted the actual seed from which the whole plant invariably grew. Whenever explaining how a philosopher's most far-fetched metaphysical uh, propositions have come about, in fact, one always does well and wisely to ask, first, what morality is it, that is, is he aiming at? Thus, I don't believe that an instinct for knowledge is the father of philosophy, but rather that here, as elsewhere, a different instinct has merely made use of knowledge, and he makes a play on this idea of knowledge with emphasizing the word know right, as its tool. For anyone who scrutinizes the basic human instincts to determine how influential they have been in it as, as inspiring spirits, or demons and goblins, will find that all the instincts have practiced philosophy and that each one of them would like only too well to represent itself as the ultimate aim of existence as the legitimate master of all the other instincts, for every instinct is tyrannical and as such seeks to philosophize. And I'm going to present something that we have done in this course, maybe unintentionally, and maybe, it, well, I can't claim that because it's my course, I designed it, I do this often, right? But as I've been leading you through this course, we've been evaluating moral systems from Socrates to Aristotle to Kant to Mill. We're foreign now, we're more than halfway. And it, Consult your own experience. As you're evaluating Kantian morality, or utilitarian morality, or Aristotelian morality, or even Socratic morality, what, what sort of questions have been, you been asking yourself? I'm willing to bet that they're similar questions to the ones that when I was taking this course low those many years ago, I was asking myself. Okay, here is a moral system that's laid out by Socrates or Aristotle or Kant or Mill kind of thing. Once I understand the system and how the system works, I then ask myself if I buy it. Do I buy it? Right. Are the judgments that emerge as a result of this system sound? What do I mean by that? Are the conclusions that come out the other end of the moral calculating mechanism in line with what I already believe? Right. I've given you this example a few times. It's easy to pick on Kant, but nonetheless, right. Roderick laid it out. I've raised it a couple of times. You know that the question that Kant was asking at the start of the grounding to the metaphysic of morals is, how are these moral judgments possible, right? How are they possible? These judgments that are moral, that we know are there, that we know are possible, how are they possible? Now, put yourself in the position of a scientist, right, where you presuppose the conclusion and build elaborate experiments in order to justify the conclusion that you've presupposed. Would that fly in sort of a scientific methodology? No. Uh, but like I was saying in the previous video, people like Jane Jacobs argue that, you know, different disciplines do this. They lay out a system and then they apply the system, and the, that the system doesn't work is hardly a problem with the system, it's a problem with the people that the system is trying to systematize, right? So we should conform to the system. But more important than that, if we are really theorists, if we are really being experimental and open to moral 
truth, if there is such a thing. If we buy that there is a moral truth and we're trying to discover it through our theoretical experiments, wouldn't it undermine our attempt to already start with a belief and consider the entire system wrong if that system does not support what we already bloody well believe? This is, this is how conspiracy theory works, right? This is why it's one of the dangerous aspects of the internet. Right? We tend to pull out evidence that reinforces the beliefs we already have. We start with belief. And then we justify that belief on the basis of whatever we're able to find in order to justify that belief. I've introduced it previously as apologetics, but this is the heart of cons conspiracy theory. Right? I believe that there are aliens that have visited the planet. Well, look at all of the evidence that I've dug out and found for these aliens having visited the planet. Right? There's all this evidence. But what you specifically looked right past is all of the lack of evidence. Right? What you've looked past are all of the fairly compelling attempts to debunk that evidence that you've... We do this. We do this with moral philosophy. So really, if we're doing moral philosophy and we're just apologizing for our beliefs, we should do maybe we should admit that we are starting with our beliefs and then attempting to shape the world in terms of what we believe in the first place. Right? Or, as Nietzsche suggests, move beyond that kind of dogmatic philosophizing. Make sense? Nietzsche suggests something else. Right? This comes out quite clearly in uh, section 11 where he's in addressing Kantian philosophy and Kantians more generally. Right? Without plotting through this passage in intricate detail, right, what I'm going to show you is the sort of move on the basis of um, the insight that he's, 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 he's issued in section 5 that all philosophy and moral philosophy is really just the personal confession of its author, right? That really it's the instincts that drive us to philosophize. It's our beliefs that are in the foreground and it's our reasons that come limping after, right? In the section on Kantians and the kinds of beliefs, right, first off um, in terms of metaphysical and epistemological beliefs, right, uh, he points out that how are synthetic a priori judgments possible? These are a kind of judgment that Kant's metaphysics depends on. Uh, wondered Kant, and uh, what did he answer? They're assisted by a faculty. Unfortunately, however, he did not say uh, this in four words, but so cumbersomely and so venerably as it, it, and with such an expense of German pr uh, profundity and ordinateness that people misheard the com common sense sort of naivete in such an answer. Right? So it, it Kant writes these tomes of books, right, um, it, effectively to say that uh, it, these judgments are possible because they're assisted by faculty. What faculty? Well, can't discover a faculty. Oh, that's great. Well, interestingly, right after that faculty was discovered, Kant introduces, and we've seen this, a moral faculty, right, that allows us to apply uh, the formulations of the categorical imperative. Right? Wow. There's a moral faculty as well. Everybody rejoiced, and everybody went out hitting the bushes, searching for new faculties. Right? What a great discovery. Right? The distinction between discovering and inventing hadn't really set into the, 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 the Kant or the, the, the sort of Kantians that followed by Nietzsche's estimation here. But nonetheless, he suggests a rephrasing of Kant's question that shows his disposition to this insight that moral philosophy and philosophy generally is the per personal confession of its author. Here, here's, here's the real question, 
right, a, a, according to Nietzsche. But answers like these belong in comedy, and this is on your page 13 in section 11. And for the Kantian question, how are synthetic a priori judgments possible? It is high time to substitute another question. Why is the belief in such judgments necessary? It's time to understand for the purpose of preserving creatures of our kind, we must believe that such judgments are true. Which means, of course, that they could still be false judgments, or to put it more cr clearly and crudely, that and, and, and completely synthetic a priori judgments should not be possible at all. We have no right to them. In our mouths, they are only false judgments. Yet the belief in their truth happens to be necessary as one of the foreground beliefs and appearances that constitute the perspective optics of life. So it's not, it's not a question of whether or not these judgments are possible. It's not a question of whether or not you know, there is truth that stands behind moral philosophy according to Nietzsche. The real question that the philosophers of the future, right, this new category of philosophers should be asking is, why, why do we need to believe the things that we seem to need to believe, right? If we could hunt out a root cause of the necessity of these various beliefs, we might actually be able to, one, gain some understanding of these beliefs, and two, assert some agency over the mechanisms that we use to give our lives meaning. Right? So, um, what Nietzsche has done is introduce Kantians along with atomists, teleologists, physics, the Stoics, Descartes and his Cartesian sort of skepticism and rationalism, logic, etc., etc. He's given us lots of examples of how this move, right, uh, the philosophy becomes uh, the personal confession of its author, right? This insight that really it's the instincts that wind up philosophizing and not some dispassionate, purely rational mechanism, right, that wheels away in our minds in order to reach some sort of conclusion, right? It's, it's really our instincts, our will, our desires that are drives that lead us to build these rational systems, right? Now, one of the most important passages in this section has to do with a four-part treatment of the will that Nietzsche enters into in section 19. My note here says, best passage I've come across regarding the will to power. Right? We're not quite at his notion of the will to power here yet. Right? He raises this towards the, the end um, in section 23. Right, where um, he introduces this idea of a morphology and evolutionary theory of the will to power. Right? The force of moral prejudices has reached far into the most spiritual world, a world apparently cold and without premise, and has obviously had a harmful, inhibiting, blinding, distorting effect, a real psychophysiology or no, physiopsychology must struggle with the unconscious resistances in the heart of the researcher. The heart is working against it. A conscience that is still strong and hearty will be distressed and annoyed even by a theory of reciprocal, uh, reciprocal conditionality of good and bad instincts, which seems to be a kind of subtle immorality and even more by a theory of the derivation of all good drives from bad ones, right? So really what Nietzsche has been trying to do is lay out sort of an understanding of our good and bad drives as though they are part of the same mechanism, right? Now where he's going to situate this is in his treatment of the will. 
we tend to think, right? Think back to your Kant here, right? To 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 to, to reminisce back to the Kantian kind of thing. There were basically three primary motive forces for Kant: reason, the will, and inclination, right? The good will, right, was the decisive factor for Kantian morality, right? Kant treats it as though it's something fairly simple. Right? The good will is one that listens to reason and does its duty. Right? It's not so good when we're led by inclination, when the will becomes slave to inclination. That's, that's, that's the understanding of Kantian philosophy, but the will was one thing. It was a simple thing and the decisive factor right? with regard to the estimation of the moral goodness in Kantian philosophy. It operates much the same way in Mill, Right, and uh, the ancients did not have as well developed a, a category of the will as do the moderns. This is something that's, that's sort of historically conditioned, but nonetheless, right, the will is generally taken to be something simple. What Nietzsche points out here, though, is that you know, actually, it's something complicated. It's not something unified except as a word. Right? Really, what Le Nietzsche lays out here is an understanding of the will wherein it is atten its attention of various competing forces. Right? He tells us, right? as I see it, the act of willing, this is in section 19, page 18, is above all something complicated, something has un uh, that has unity only as a word. I suppose I could have just quoted this, right? And uh, this common prejudice of using only one word has overridden the philosopher's caution, which was never all that great anyway. So let us be more cautious for once. Let us be unphilosophical. Let us say that in every act of willing, there's, first of all, a multiplicity of feelings, namely, the feeling of the condition of moving away from, the feeling of the condition of, of moving towards, the feeling of this away and towards, and uh, the concomitant feeling in the muscles without are actually moving the arms and legs comes into play out of a kind of habit whenever we will. What Nietzsche calls feeling here, I tend to think of in terms of sensation. Right? We have a sensation, a rootedness, a bodily rootedness in the world. This is a function of the will, right? I mean, really think about, and this is the example that I usually use to introduce this, trying to get out of bed in the morning. I know this morning my kids were up and they were, uh, they, you know, sort of hollering and flumping around in their room and that sort of thing. And I look over at the clock and say, oh, is it time to get up yet? And that sort of thing. My alarm goes off. My partner's alarm goes off. My alarm goes off again. And then, fine, 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 I'm up. Right? But part of the act of making me get out of bed in the morning was the fact that, you know, the bed is warm. My limbs are tired. You know, I have this sensation of a kind of spatial location in the world. I have a toothache. I have all of these bodily sensations, right, that are sort of the foundation for the act of the will. Nietzsche continues. Second, just as we must recognize feeling, or what I'm calling sensation, and indeed many kinds of sensation, just translated as an ingredient of the will, so must we likewise recognize thinking. In every act of the will there is a commanding thought. We must not deceive ourselves that this thought can be separated off from willing as if we would then have any will left over. All right? So some sort of conceptual understanding of our scenario. All right? So thinking maybe what Kant would call reason, right? but not so clean as what Kant is talking about, because remember, thinking is instinctual, desirous, drive-oriented kind of activity for Nietzsche. Right? So the act of thought is never a pure act. Right? So we have this 
on top of a bodily sort of situated sensation oriented kind of foundation we have this sort of cognitive activity right that goes into the act of the will third the will is not merely a complex of feelings sensations and, and cognitive activity it is above all an emotion and in fact the emotion of command what is called freedom of the will is essentially the emotion of superiority felt towards one who must obey i'm free he must obey this consciousness lies in every will as does also a tense alertness a direct gaze a con a concentrated on one thing alone an unconditional ass assessment that now we must have this and nothing else an inner certainty that obedience will follow and everything else that goes along with the condition of giving a command a person who wills this person is commanding a something in himself that obeys or thinks it is obeying so we have sensations feelings in our muscles spatial locations that sort of thing we have a cognitive awareness of our situation and then we have the emotion the emotion of command right everything associated with it right we we have this directedness that is a brute as Nietzsche points out emotional right I am going to get out of bed right I'm going to do this right oh okay okay I'm moving right but remember I said there were four let us consider the strange the strangest thing about the will about its multifarious uh, this multifarious thing that the common people call by one word alone in any given case we both command and obey and when we obey we know the feelings of coercion pressure oppression resistance and agitation that begin immediately after the act of will on the other hand we're in the habit of ignoring or overlooking this division uh, division by means of the synthetic concept i see what we did okay okay I'm up we felt it in our muscles we've got a cognitive understanding of our situation and when we will we're congratulating ourselves for commanding ourselves out of bed ha ha I'm a victor I am up right. but if we command there's something in us that's obeying right. and that's the all right all right Right. You see, what Nietzsche has laid out is a complicated tension right? that shows that the act of the will is not a simple act. Right? Our freedom of the will is not a simple kind of freedom. Really, it's a feat of strength every time we exercise the will. There's something in us that resists. Right? Think about the last time you forced yourself to have an uncomfortable conversation that you've been avoiding. Think about the last time you've, well, probably right this minute now as you're studying philosophy. Uh, there's Professor Young, he's going on and on again. But no, I have to concentrate because I want to learn this stuff. I want to engage with moral philosophy. I, I want to get a good grade in this course. I want to do well in the university. I have to do this. You see, there's this tension within yourself in every single act of the will. Right? And whenever we act, there's something in us that overcomes something else within us. So it concludes, right? down the page this is on 19 um, uh, suffice to say the person willing thinks um, uh, with some degree of certainty that will and action are somehow one he attributes his success in carrying out his willing to the will itself and in this way enjoys an increase in that feeling of power that accompanies any kind of success freedom of the will that is the word for the complex ple pleasurable condition experienced by the person willing who commands and simultaneously identifies himself with the one who executes the command as such 
<clears throat> he can share in enjoying the triumph over resistance while secretly judging that it was actually his will that overcame the resistance. Thus, the person willing adds to the pleasurable feeling as commander the pleasurable feelings of the successful ex executing instrument, the serviceable under will the, uh, or under soul. Our body, uh, after all, is nothing, uh, uh, nothing but a social structure of many souls. The effect is me. What is occurring here occurs in every well-structured community where uh, the ruling class identifies with the success of the community as a whole. As we've said, every act of willing is simply a matter of commanding and obeying based on a social structure of many souls. For this reason, a philosopher should claim the right to comprehend willing from within the sphere of ethics. Ethics that is understood as the theory of hierarchical relationships among which the phenomena of life has its origin. You see, the idea of the act of will uh, is actually a messy act by Nietzsche's estimation. It's a feat of strength. There are resistances, internal ones. Any time we force ourselves to do something, we command, but we also obey. Right? The act of the will is not a simple, simple kind of thing, but we tend to think of it as something that is simple. We tend to think about it as though uh, the will is something I exercise over, right? But really we're comprised of these competing desires, instincts, sensations, emotions, that sort of thing, that all coalesce into, we like to think, coherent action. Right? So, like, to a certain extent, well, not even to a certain extent, I'm reminded of the first passage in On the Genealogy of Morals, another late work of Nietzsche's, which reads, I used to use this book for this class, We remain unknown to ourselves, we seekers after knowledge, even to ourselves, and with good reason, we've never sought after ourselves. So how should we one day find ourselves? Eh? We don't even seek after ourselves. We simplify our concepts of ourselves, either in terms of narrative or synthetic concepts that bring unity to something that's actually a multiplicity. Eh? So Nietzsche's treatment of the will shows that these moral philosophies that have come before, oh, well, it's an act of the will, you should will this, you shouldn't will that, that sort of thing. Well, well it's not quite that simple, all right? It's not quite that simple. So, all right? Now, effectively, this is all to say that it, when we will, we do not do so in a plainly kind of free way. Remember that fundamental presupposition of ethics, none of this makes sense unless we are free, right, in some sort of autonomy sense in the Kantian it, it, sort of it, we can act on the basis of rules that we give ourselves. That was the Kantian notion of autonomy. That's this complicated notion of freedom, right? So it's reason acts upon the will and then generates behavior that's consistent and for the sake of duty, right? Consistent with the formulations of the categorical imperative and for the sake of duty. Uh, that's, that's the moral philosophy of Kant. We are somehow autonomous, removed from, free from our instincts and desires and able to give ourselves rules and act on those rules. Well, by Nietzsche's structure here, what he's just laid out, and I mean to a certain extent, consult your experience. Every time you sit down to do something, any time you force yourself, like I say, to have a conversation that you don't want to have, you ever break up with somebody and not want to? Right? There's that tension within yourself. Right? I, I remember years ago I was about to break up with someone and I was driving myself to their house to break up with them face to face and in the drive there I was saying, boy, I hope 
I have the guts to do this. We're still unknown to ourselves. That's because every time we try to will something, there's going to be something that resists us. There's this tug and pull, and any number of things could set it out in a kind of position of the, 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 <laughs> that moment to my reflective sort of self-judgment is the moment when I should have bloody broken up with her. I should have. Life would be so much different if I just had the guts, right? The will strong enough to go through with the act. So this is all to say that the will is not free in the way that we tend to think of it. But on the other hand, uh, Nietzsche points out in section 21 that uh, why isn't that on the board? Uh, oh, anyhow, it should be. Uh, the will is not really unfree either. Uh, I mean, effectively, right, what we are doing when we're saying that, well, we don't have a free will, is like, oh, well, we have an unfree will. But remember, this whole belief and value oppositions needs to be gotten beyond as well. If the will is really how Nietzsche describes it, the act of will is a feat of strength. So, effectively, the will is not free in the sense that it is unencumbered by you know, the sort of internal tensions that Nietzsche's just laid out there, that Kant says the will should be unencumbered by, right? Well, then the will is not properly unfree either, right? It's not really unfree. Think about the last time you've, you've, you've built something or solved some sort of physical problem. Right? Your ability to overcome some sort of an obstacle. I don't care if it's you hopped a fence or jump-started your car or installed the dishwasher or cut your grass or something along those lines. Right? You're not free in the sense that you are removed from the challenges of these particular kinds of experience. It's not as though some sort of dispassionate reason then acted on your will and you there was conflict within you, but you still did it. There's a notion of agency that's emerging from Nietzsche. There's a notion of agency. So just because we're not free in the sense that we'd like to be, it's not some sort of absolute freedom of the will that it marks us off as beings with dignity, as objects of respect, does not mean that we are unfree either. Right? We're agents. And if willing is a feat of strength, what Nietzsche points out is that really we should stop talking about free or unfree wills. It's in section 21 on page 21. I love how often that happens. Right? We alone are the ones who invented causes, succession, reciprocity, uh, relativity, coercion, number, law, freedom, reason, purpose, and if we project, if we mix this world of science into things as if it were an in itself, we act once more as we've always done. That is mythologically. Right? So our modes of understanding things tend to, tend to tyrannize over our behavior in the world. And if we try to apply our systems to the world as though the world has to conform to our systems rather than our systems to reality, then we are acting in Nietzsche's sense mythologically. I'll quickly pause to explain this. I don't know if there are Star Wars fans in there, but and um, it, here's here's the cardinal sin. I'm going to talk about the prequels. Um, and it, the middle prequel, which was the good one, at very least, kind of thing. If you recall that 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 scene where um, Obi Wan is trying to find uh, this planet Camino, kind of thing, and he goes into the library to talk to the my least favorite Jedi, the librarian, kind of thing. He says, "Well, you know, 
It seems I've got a reliable source that tells me there is a planet here, but it's not in our library archives. My least favorite Jedi librarian responds to Master Kenobi. Master Kenobi, if it doesn't exist, if it's not in our archives, it doesn't exist. It's a brilliant exa example of presupposing that your system is more real than reality. All right. Thankfully, there was Yoda to set them straight, the little pad wands, but nonetheless, this is a common error. Right? The system tells me this should be as it is, but it's not as it is. Right? Well, that's a problem with reality. It's not a problem with our system. This is the bureau uh, bureaucracy kind of oriented kind of way of thinking that we're trained to be in the world. So, what does this have, have to do with um, the will? The unfree will is mythology. In real life, it is only a matter of strong and weak wills. Whenever a thinker sniffs out um, uh, <coughs> coercion, necessity, obligation, pressure, constraint in any causal connection or um, uh, psychological necessity, it is almost always a system of uh, where his own <coughs> inadequacy lies. To feel this particular way is revealing. The person is revealing himself. And if I have observed correctly, the constraint of the will is always conceived as a problem from two completely opposite standpoints, but always profound, uh, in a profoundly personal way. The one group will not hear of re uh, re relinquishing their responsibility, the belief in themselves, their personal right to take uh, their credit um, in the vain, race, uh, the vain races are of this type. Conversely, the other group wants to be responsible for nothing, guilty of nothing, and uh, out of uh, their inner self-contempt, they yearn to cast off their own selves one way or another. When this latter group writes books nowadays, they tend to take up the cause of criminals. A sort of so, uh, socialistic compassion is their nicest disguise. And indeed, it is surprising how much prettier than fatalism of the weak willed, uh, the, the, the fatalism of the weak willed can look when it uh, re uh, presents itself as um, the, 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 for the sake of human suffering. Uh, that is um, what it means by good taste, right? So there's this tension, right? There's this tension that exists with regard to the will. Some people uh, want to say that, no, we're completely unfree, we're determined, I had no choice, it's not my fault, it's not my fault, kind of thing, right? And generally when these people write books, they take up the case of the criminal and show how the criminal is, you know, conditioned a product of society and just through silly little think-breaking bad, think-breaking bad, right? And, or at least the first season of Breaking Bad, which is all I know about, right? So, right, that's the one case. On the other hand, there is a class of people that want to believe in an absolutely free will, right, wherein they don't want to relinquish their responsibility or their ability to take credit for their achievements. Right? What Nietzsche is suggesting here is that we give up both extremes. We're not free, we're not unfree. Effectively, right, it's a matter of strong or weak wills. When it comes right down to it, we're not autonomous, right? Or determined. What we are is agents, wrapped up, bound up within a system of power, trying to make our marks. And this is one of the, for me, sexiest things about Nietzsche. Yeah, I just called it sexy, I know, right? It's a particular kind of philosopher that can find a theory sexy, right? But nonetheless, this is effectively one of the, 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 the awesome things for me about Nietzsche is that he sees us not as autonomous beings or determined beings, but rather agents. Agents subject to history, situation, culture, determined by factors like economy and a finite amount of strength within the world, right? But nonetheless, 
with wills that 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 that, that turn us into not only effects of this system. We're not just cogs in a wheel, but rather we're agents that have some sort of control and power within the context of the situation that we find ourselves in. Uh -huh. So, uh, unlike Kant, it's not dispassioned morality. And unlike Socrates, it's not reason as opposed to opinion, belief, or desire, right? Unlike Mill, we're not completely led by pleasure, right? Calculating the greatest good for the greatest number, which is still a rational exercise. Rather, we are emotional, instinctual beings with a capacity to think, embedded in a world that has power relations, right? That we can engage with, but only from a perspective of existing within this world. Right? Now, this is, this is going to be one of the, the challenges for this new category of philosophers, these philosophers of the future that he says are on the rise. This is one of the challenges because how do we exist within a system as being to some extent produced by that system. I mean, God, I watch the Marvel superhero movies. I watch CNN. I've seen Fox News. I know that, you know, my presuppositions are fostered because I see myself doing it to my daughters. No, that's good. No, that's bad. Don't do that, etc., etc., etc. I see myself habituating my own children. All right? We're all raised in the context of these belief structures and these power relations in ways that we're not always conscious of yet. Yet, we have some power within the context of these beliefs and these power relations. We're not helpless, but we're not completely unaffected, right? As the philosophers of the past have thought it was possible for us to be. So uh, that's section one, right? Um, I started off by talking about section 23, right? So this is going to be right, the, the, the task for this new category of philosophers to become aware of and resist and respond to the unconscious resistances that are present within each of us. Uh, I, I know sometimes when I read like even a moral theory, I just I just don't like it. I just don't like it, right? But it then becomes my job to ask, well, why don't I like it? Is there something about this that is actually problematic, or is it some sort of presupposition or prejudice within me that is disposing myself to this in a way that I resist, right? So. That become it begins it, that becomes the game right for uh, the next section right called the free spirit right this is a free spirit it's not freedom of the will that he's talking about it's a situated kind of freedom within the context of these belief structures so the free spirit and this new category of philosopher are going to be ones that recognize their situation subject to these belief structures and cultural and institutional power structures, right, yet is able to assert relatively a little bit of independence and agency in the face of them. Right? All right, so thank you.